Welcome everyone to the very first speaker series for uh, our series of webinars to celebrate the Great Salish Bio Blitz, which kicked off on Friday and is going on until Sunday. So for those of you who don't know, a Bio Blitz is an event where you try to identify as many species in a set location as you can in a certain amount of time. And often they're in person, but of course we can't meet in person in the same way. So um, we were trying to bring some of that educational and learning component into the BioBlitz through the speaker series. So that was kind of the incentive for this. And um, I'm really, really excited to have Paul Acton here from the Squamish Nation. And before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that I'm joining from the territory of the Songhees, Esquimalt, and Wasatch people and uh, Victoria, but the Salish Sea Bio Blitz is occurring all throughout the Salish Sea, which encompasses many different Coast Salish territories. Um, and I'm from the Georgia Strait Alliance, which is a regional marine conservation organization that has been working for 30 years to advocate for the health of the communities um, around the Salish Sea. And I would also, before we introduce Holactin, would like to introduce my co-host Chelsea, who is my dear friend and has is helping me organize this week of bio blitzing. Hi all, I'm Chelsea. Uh, I'm a part of the Ocean Bridge 2020 cohort. Ocean Bridge is a national youth program from Oceanwise that brings together Canadian youth to organize and participate in ocean and waterway service projects. So Ocean Bridge is partnered with Canada Service Corps, a government initiative that focuses on community service by Canadian youth. And the program provides mentorship, education, and resources for program participants to help inspire and support youth in their ocean and waterway volunteer efforts and community service projects. Kirsten's also an Ocean Bridge alumni, and uh, the Great Sailor Sea Bio Blitz is um, part of my community service project through Ocean Bridge. Yeah. So yeah, it's been really fun working with Chelsea on the BioBlitz and we're really excited about how the BioBlitz is going so far. So like I mentioned, this webinar is just part of it. The other part of it is that you can actually download the iNaturalist app on your smartphone and get outside and take observations wherever you live. It's really fun. And so far our project has um, identified over 1000 different observations uh, 410 different species. So it's, I'm really excited to see those numbers go up over the course of the week. Um, and yeah, so our speaker today is Holactin and Chelsea is going to introduce him. Or my, oops, is that, oops, my bad. <laughs> I'm gonna introduce him. Uh, he has a very, um, awesome background in art and culture and we're really excited to sh see the stories that he's going to share with us in the art. We are getting a little preview before the webinar went live. So Holactin was born and raised in Squamish. He carries with him the rich ancestries of his father's Squamish nation and his mother's Quapakuat nation of the Coast Salish clans. His father, Pecultan carried a hereditary chieftainship from Seymour Creek in North Vancouver. He would like to acknowledge the Capilano College and Emily Carr College of Art for teaching him the skills to have a start in his career. His endurance and commitment through trial and error helped him propel him forward as an artist. Colactin is an accomplished artist in wood, paper, stone, glass, and metals. Recent significant works can be seen at the West Vancouver Community Centre, um, Whistler's Peak Building, University of Victoria, Capilano University, Emily Carr University, and West Vancouver Secondary School. Healing, growth, and raising an awareness of environment are central themes in Holactin's work. By focusing on how the traditional stories relate to his own life, he suggests to us how we can use ancient knowledge to help heal ourselves in our community. The giving out of positive energy and seeing it come through the young people is the reward that continues to feed his spirit so that he can give back to others. So um, thank you so much, Holactin, and I will turn it over to you now for the next little bit. Okay, OCM, thank you for the introduction. Hi, this, my name is Holactin. I grew up with the name Rick Harry. And for myself as a young person, I've been on the waters a lot because my father and brothers, we used to be on the water a lot and we used to food gather 
you know, back in the day when I was young. So I am still young at 62, and I feel really young yet. I'm still working hard in my life. I enjoy it, and I uh, enjoy sharing with people. And uh, my hopes are I can offer you something today. And my offering is I would like to just start off with, um, you know, like I grew up in Squamish and I always heard stories, but our stories are somewhat broken up, but we're trying to piece it back together. Cause you know, this, uh, a lot of our libraries have passed away, our elders, our ancestors. So a lot of stories are, we're probably incomplete, so we're kind of piecing it together. And I, in my in my own journey, I feel like I piece it together in my own life journey, how these stories can relate in my journey to help make things better in, la in life, not just for myself, but people around me or for the environment. Because every time I drink of water, water is life. I think about the water that gives life to all things. And everything always ends up uh, out in the the sea and the ocean. <clears throat> so in our teachings too, we always learn that we have to at times we have what we call cold river baths. When we go into the river, we cleanse ourselves, mind, body, spirit, and we let it out with sound. And with that sound, we can bring out that if there was any negative energy and it goes into the water and the water takes it away from us and it goes in down to the river, into the sound, and out to the sea, the sailor sea, and out to the ocean. Takes it away from us so that we feel enlightenment from that. So I have a lot of teachings behind that, and I probably go on with a lot of that stuff, but um, I want to start off with a, a song to welcome you all here. I mentioned they're on the the unceded territories of, of the original peoples here. And, and uh, you know, we have the peoples, because we always talk about people, the water people, the plant people, the two-legged people, and the crawling things. So everything is related, we're all related. We all need each other to carry on in a good journey in life. So I wanna uh, share a song just to begin us off. And the song is a greeting. And the person, the name who sang the song is Suqualia. Suqualia would get up early and climb a, maybe a little mountain and look around. And just as daylight's coming, she would share a song to greet the day. What I'll do is I'll just sing a taste of it because, you know, I don't want to sing the whole song. It'll take a while to do. So I designed my drum here. It's a sailor's drum. The Thunderbird. The Thunderbird is like the creator. And our energy, this energy is going this direction with the Thunderbird, but the energy of this one is also going the opposite direction. In Salish, we do our ceremonies going counterclockwise. <clears throat> so Sequalia would share the song, look around and pay attention to all her surroundings and give thanks. She might see birds singing. She might see animals moving around. She might see salmon swing, swimming by. And she will breathe and give thanks with the song. Oh, 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 oh. Oh. Oh, 
watching and also the hands go a little higher for a big welcome big welcome to this high tech area we're all get to share and learn a little bit about one another and it's probably bringing more people in with more ears to share now even though this COVID-19 is going on there's more to share with people coming on high tech devices like this so we get to share more <clears throat> I'd like to also share about the Thunderbird. Thunderbird is so great, so big that we can't see it, but it's so small that it's here. And we had stories of the Thunderbird landing on what today we call Black Tusk. And it would land there and create these big winds with its wings moving. And it's when the wings hit, creates the thunder, and the eyes blink to create the lightning. And then big water comes, big rain. And we had a time when it rained so much that a great flood happened. And our people had canoes like this. And if I look, you should look at my hand, they had canoes like this. And these canoes, when the water started to rise, these canoes were put together and tied together and we had these planks that we were able to tie from our houses. They were never nailed, they were tied. We created like barges and the water rose and it was the great flood that happened. And as that flood happened, <clears throat> as time went by, we ran out of food and the creator, the Thunderbird, sent the eagle to gather some to gather some salmon. So I got a little feather. This is a force armor feather. Eagle, salmon, and a stomach, a human being. So the eagle was sent by the creator to catch these salmon and drop it off in our canoes so we could still survive this flood. And as the water came back down, the people remained we anchored our canoes by what we call Inchakai, is where we call Mount Garibaldi today. But our name for that is Inchakai. Inchakai means where the dirty water comes from. There's a runoff from that. Usually the water that comes from that creek is usually dirty looking. And it runs into the Chekhamas River, which is crystal clear. And where they, these two meet, the dirty water meets the clear water. And there is a place up there we call Chikai. And Chikai is coming from Inchikai. Inchikai. And uh, the, um, as the water went down, the people started to float. Some were set afloat and they latched on to what we now call Mount Baker. And we have, if you think of Squamish and then go over what we call the false border of US and Canada, there is Snohomish, Duwamish, Suquamish, and it's all like how it sounds for us, Squamish. So we're all related on this, this coast here. And we're all the same people. And um, so this is why we call the Salish Sea. We call it Coast Salish. Uh, they're, they're going by the language. We're Squamish, and the language is, um, uh, the Salish languages are quite similar because there's some words we would say that we could understand one another from the people on the island and people from the mainland and people from down south, like far as Olympia State. We have language quite similar. Some will say Osiam, some will say Asiam, right? So it's just the language. So that's just why they propose to call it the Salish Sea. So with the flood story, you know, 
the water comes from the skies to the mountains, to the streams, to the creeks, to the rivers, to the sounds, out to the Salish Sea, and out to the ocean. So it's all connected. So it's really one body of water. So water is life. So in my life journey, I used to drink fire water, but now I purified myself. And now I drink clear water, water from the Creator. It's real good water. I enjoy it nowadays. So anyways, I went on a journey in 1993. And this is my year of my sobriety coming up. And I joined a canoe journey. So this print, I did this print here behind me. There's people standing here in the canoe. This is the one we call the Kohulf, the Squamish Nation canoe. The Kohulf is a seaworthy canoe. And it's we're able to go out in the Sailor Sea and we travel from there up to Bella Bella Wegisla, the village named Wegisla up there. We as we traveled, we learned a lot about one another. And as I moved through the waters to the Sailor Sea, we went up towards Seymour Narrows and up to what we call Charlotte Sound and up to Bella Bella. There's a lot of teachings that happen. But to go on such a journey like that, we had to purify ourselves, clean ourselves, mind, body, and spirit. So we prepared ourselves. We would, like I mentioned, we went for our cold river baths and we had sweat lodges and we fast and we we did physical exercises and then we also trained in the canoe. And, uh, some parts of our canoe when we we're training, we would go up uh, towards the narrows, like first narrows, second narrows. And when the tide's running, we would throw a bucket in the water tied to the canoe and we had holes in the bucket and it would slow us down and we're bucking tied, but we're pulling hard. With our with our paddles and and as we're doing that, we weren't moving. We're just we're draining out. We're working with our mind now because our mind has to overcome what's happening. We're bucking tide. We got a bucket behind us, slowing us down, and we're just working with our body and our mind and our spirit. Just okay. Just keep going. Just keep going because we might run into times like this where we'll have struggles. Because the, the sea it may look calm, but it's always moving. It's got a lot of life in there. It's powerful. We're always taught, respect the water. If you don't respect it, it might take you. So we always have to think of mind, our balance in ourselves and balance in our canoe. So pulling like that, it helped us train us that way. <clears throat> and in our lodges, we would go into a sweat lodge and we bring in these lava stones that were in a fire for quite some time. And we bring it into the sweat lodge and when you close the lodge up, it's glowing with red rocks. And as we go in there, we're looking at these red rocks and it's getting starting to get hot now because you're getting starting to sweat because those you bring in quite a few stones in there. And you start sweating. And yeah. Uh, they say as you go in, you crawl in on all, crawl in to represent the crawly things. And then you're on your fours, you represent the four-legged people, deer, bear. Then you go on, we have cedar boughs inside, so you represent the plant people are there with us. And then you have, we sit down perched like we're as humans and as like birds. So, we're looking at what we call might see as the universe. We're looking into this red amber stone in the middle of the lodge and we're sweating. And they say what we have to offer is our inner self. So we sweat, we bring out any bad impurities that bother us, bring it out, let it sweat, it goes back to the earth. So there's water again, water is important. And that's when you really appreciate drinking water more is when you sweat that water out, you want to replant, replenish it, bring water back in. And when we come out of the lodge after rounds, we use water, cold water. We, you're hot and you spill cold water on yourselves. And it's 
it just enlightens you. You feel like you're lifted up about a foot off the ground, just enlightens you. Just, whoa, wow, I feel good. Right? So to train to go on these journeys, that's what we did. And we go in those rivers and oceans just to have those cold baths. This would be like in January. And we'd be in there because if we're on the canoe journey, if the canoe happens to flip over in the sea there, that you don't want to panic. You want to be able to endure that cold for a while and be calm and get back in that canoe. And we had to train how to get the water out of that canoe. So we get out of that water quick as possible. And uh, I did that with my family canoe. And we went out in the water and I told the family, I, I want everybody in this canoe to try to flip it. And I'm the skipper here and I'm going to try to hold that canoe and try to stop it from flipping over. This is so they can get trust in the canoe and also in the skipper. So I had the paddle and the water bar and they're trying to they're trying to tip the canoe and I'm trying to keep it steady so it doesn't flip. And they couldn't get it turned over. So I said, okay, I'm going to help you. I'm not going to do this now. Now we're going to flip it. We flipped it. And so now we're in the ocean, the salt chuck. Now we need to get out. How long is it going to take us to get out? So I had someone out on the wharf away from us. I asked them, as soon as it goes over time, we'll see how long it takes us to get the canoe, all the water out and all this back in. So what we did is after we flipped it over, we turned the canoe. We lifted a little bit and we had one person, the lightest person in there, throwing water out. And everybody's in on the outside of the canoe, flicking water out like this until the canoe raised up and we throw someone else in and they're in the canoe and we're just bailing all that water out. It took us about eight and a half minutes to empty that canoe and we're all back in and moving again. So we had to work with our mind, body, and spirit again. And, um, it was a nice journey because uh, as we were on that journey on this called Wolf, we always left one seat open. The whole canoe was filled up. We had 11 pullers in it. And we always left one, one, one open, one seat open. And that was for the people who wanted to come on the journey with us. And it was empty for the ancestors. And it's empty for the ones that aren't here yet. Because on that journey, we have to think about the ones ahead of us. They have to have what we have. So this whole canoe journey is teaching us what we need to do. What is our responsibility to help keep everything moving in a good direction? That means our, our sailor sea needs to be clean. Because we we take what we need from that from the uh, from the salt check we take the clams the crabs the salmon the herring you know there's sea urchins there's so much food out there for us back in the day they said the table was set when the tide went out that's where we get our food so it was important to have a healthy water and we'll we'll be healthy and. Um, just the other, just yesterday news, they were showing the killer whales moving through the Salish Sea. And they were um, only like about 75 of them going through. They must have had a great time with this coronavirus stuff going on too, because the waters were quiet. Right? And uh, we were seeing, even when I was sitting here out in Ambleside Beach, this is this where this print is taking place, Ambleside Beach. I had my binoculars on. My son was playing with a friend. She wanted to bring him down. I just went to join him and I had my binoculars on and I was looking out. And I saw like probably 200 dolphins going through. And they weren't going fast. They were just taking their time very slow. Just slowly going through. And I noticed boats going by. And I don't even think they noticed they were there because they were just zipping by them. They weren't even, when people are focused, sometimes they do this. They're just going. But if you're like in a canoe, you're 
you just kind of pay attention to your surroundings, quiet. So I was letting people know, but they, you actually needed binoculars to see it because the naked eye, can you barely see them because they're quite a ways over, closer to Kitsilano area. But I was thinking, oh, maybe it'll show up on news today. Maybe somebody will, will notice it and send some photos to the news and it never happened. Was I the only one that saw these? <laughs> the, um, I did this print and um, we were able to pick a, they picked 12 artists from the North Shore here. And it was 2000 when I made this print and they had artists pick out certain areas along the land and give historical, historical sites on those areas. And we had villages around this area back in the day and, and uh, we have people who come to visit. They would come close to their shores like this and they would stop and they raise their paddles up. When they get close to the shore, they raise your paddles up. That symbolized we come in peace. And we're showing respect for, for one another this way. But usually before they get this close, they would share a song. And that song would be sung so the people in the villages could hear them coming. And already they will know who they are because they may have heard that song before. And for Coast Salish people, we usually had figures out in the front holding their hands up like this, a carved figure. That symbolizes it's a big welcome. Come visit, come visit us. So they would come and they would share their song, the paddles are up. And then one of the hereditary chiefs would come at the in front of the beach. By then the whole village is all along the waterfront. They may share a song back to them. And they, um, uh, the person that stands here, I'm, like I'm showing on the print here, he stands. And you make announcement who they are, where they're from, and ask him permission to come ashore. And uh, sure, we invite them, come feast with us, and we'll have a great time. But they would share knowledge here the protocol. So even if when we traveled up to Wagisla, every place where we went to, we would do this protocol, make that acknowledgement that we're coming to visit. We come in peace and show respect for one another. <clears throat> so being on that water, I sure learned a lot about not only about myself, but my culture, about my community, about well, friendship, um, especially, you know, just when you're on that journey, you're focused. When you're focused, you're, you have people in front of you and they have this, this Coast Salish eye. Now, when you're paddling, that's what we're focused on. We're looking at that eye. That's to remind us that we're being watched. We're being watched by the creator. We're being watched by our ancestors. We're being watched by our community, community and our friends and ourself, our conscience. So when we move, we gotta keep that focus and be strong for others. And we, we work hard, we pull, we call it pulling. We used to tease one another out of laughter. You know, some some people you might see us wearing a t-shirt says on the back of their t-shirt, shut up and paddle. Because we're got to maintain your focus. <laughs> Anyways, uh, they, just keep, they got your eye on you. Make sure you're doing good. Um, so that Coast Salish eye is just a, a good reminder that we've been watched all the time. <clears throat> and, uh, Being on the water, you learn about the tides. Like I shared a little bit about it when we were pulling through the narrows there with a, a bucket. 
and there was one place where it scared us because it's the first time we were doing a big journey like this, probably 80 to 100 years. There was uh, Seymour Narrows. He says, it's, uh, when the tide moves, it can be very scary because it could, it could swallow you. So we had to go at a certain time. And they already put it on us because we're just young men, eh? that we got to get through this real quick. So when the tide came slack, we were gone. We were on our way. And we we're pulling hard, really hard, focused. Canoe is moving real strong. And we get, we're probably pulled for about an hour and a half. And I says, well, where are these rapids? Oh, we passed them. They're way back there. <laughs> so they, uh, the elderly people will just teach us that and tell us, tell us those things afterwards, after we've been through it. Another one was uh, Dodd's Narrows was the same. It's very powerful water there. It's real swift from, you know, Dodd's Narrows Sailor Sea there. So we went and uh, had four people in our family canoe. This was our family canoe here. I made this family canoe and I made it uh, to carry our family because my, my, I, my father had passed, but no one was carrying the name, Bacalton. Bacalton was our chief's name for our family. So I built the canoe and the family came and helped. And we put the name on it, put Bacalton on it to carry the family for a while. But now my youngest brother's carrying the name, the hereditary name from uh, what we now call Seymour Creek. <clears throat> but, you know, we're going on the, four of us are going to head off and, we started from Nanaimo, and we're heading towards Couch and Bay. And uh, we need to get through that narrows before before the uh, tide turns. So I looked at the tide book, and the tide book uh, gave me a time. It says we got to go. So off we went. I took my crew. We went. And by the time we arrived there. The tide switched already. It was starting to, water starting to bubble. I was, what? We didn't make it on time? What's going on? So anyways, um, what happened is because of the daylight change, the, day, the time change from the tide book, it was an hour difference. Oh, so oh, I didn't figure that out. But we would have made it through on slack tide. We could have made it through there, and not even a, not even a bother. It would have been just super nice to go past it. But we didn't make it in time, and we tried to pull through it. We couldn't do it. We got halfways because you're just struggling, and then all of a sudden the tide, the tide is so strong, it swung. If you, the canoe goes over just enough, it just swings and takes off. The tide takes you. You just have to keep it dead on, right on, so it doesn't grab the canoe and swing you around. So made me think about the, uh, the uh, respect for water again. And as we carried on that on that journey, because we're going to Couch and Bay, we got to a place called Cherry Point, and the tide still is too strong. I got to a place, just got to get around that point, and we made it to Couch and Bay. And we're there, there's a lighthouse there, a small little lighthouse. We're pulling. Hour and a half later, we're still looking at the lighthouse. We didn't move. And we just struggle. I said, we can't quit now. We got to keep going. And uh, it was still too strong. So I said, okay, we got to try something different. So we pulled way out, went further out. Kept pulling, and as we pulled across, it brought us, just made it past it, and we made it through. And as we got to Couch and Bay, I just flopped. I was so tired. And then I cramped up that night. Wow, it's, that water was so powerful. I says, got to respect that water. So I enjoy going out there in the water, in the Salish Sea especially if you're on the canoe, it's quiet. You hear your paddles going through the water. You hear, see wildlife sometimes going by you. And 
just feeling yourself move. With the Kahuls, this we were going one time 18 knots. This guy was on another boat. He says, you guys are going 18 knots. Wow, that's, that's pretty fast. We're going with the tide, but we're also in good shape by then. And we pulled pretty good. Um, <clears throat> another thing about the water, I was down in uh, Port Townsend. I brought my kayak out and I put my kayak in. My wife was with me. And it was a double kayak. So I sat in the kayak. We're going out in the water. And I told her, I said, oh, this song just came to me. It's in my head right now. I have to sing it. You might, you might have to hear it too. And I told Jada, I said, I need you to hear it because I might forget the song. So I started singing singing it and it sounded like this oh, oh, hey. trying to find a song or anything it just it just came to me and I, I heard stories at times that songs come to you from the water just being out in the water and then um, I kept that song with me and I said and I got invited to Nia Bay to a potlatch what we call a potlatch today, today to a feast and how they invited me is they came up, drove up. It was early in the morning and I was just up for breakfast and I heard some drumming and I heard my name. My driveway is about 50, 50 feet long. So I opened the door and I saw some people out the edge of my driveway. So I danced out there with my, my, my robe on, I danced out to them. And I wait till they finish their song. And these were hereditary chiefs from down there. And they asked me if I would come to a feast with them, to a potlatch. And I said, yes, I would. I'd love to come. And they says, well, they took these rolls of uh, cedar kindling of 10 bundles. And they laid it all in front of me. And they said, whatever amount you pick up, that's how many people we're going to think of feeding. So they must have had bundles and bundles all handed out. So that's how they figured out how many people were going to show up. So I would pick up, I only picked up 10. So I took 10 people with me. And uh, what they laid out like a dozen, I thought I was going to bring like 100 people or something. <laughs> So anyways, I went down there and I, and I shared with them the song when I was down there. I said, the song came to me. And I loved, because it was closer to their territory, I said to them, I want to share the song. And if anybody knows the song, it belongs to you. Or if you want the song, someone wants to take that song, we can take it. Because sometimes songs come to you for someone else. So I did that route and I shared that. And no one came forward with that song. So just being on that water, I learned a song. And there's others on canoe journeys. They, they pick up songs on canoe journeys. Um, <clears throat> so water was very important to us because we traveled to different communities and we were able to feast in potlatch because our governing areas were through the oral history through storytelling so we would be able to call witnesses and for some of you who don't know what the witnesses are today we use 50 cent coins to represent one blanket and that blanket back in the day if you received the blanket it was a real great honor because it would have taken somebody's hands 
to make that blanket by hand right from scratch. So uh, a lot of times they would have designs of water. I actually have a piece here that represents water. It's the beadwork. And the, um, this is not, this beadwork is coming from a person that's Ukraine. She beaded this and she started explaining how important water was to, to their, to their people. And I said, well, I want that. I'm going to, I'm going to have to purchase that. So, and then, uh, again, water, salmon. The salmon was, um, I just have a five year old son now. And all I have four children. One's Kilia butterfly. The other one is Nuch Kalos, his old wise one. And there's Kushal, whose grandfathers. And Kuo, which means big spring salmon, is Stanley. But when he was born, I didn't, we didn't. My wife wanted to pick names out and everything and search names. I says, uh, I don't do that. I mean, if you want to search for a name, play with names, that's okay with me. But normally I don't do it that way. I just wait for something to come. And anyways, after he was born, I was crashed. I was tired. and Jada was tired. And I was in this dream world because I wanted to find a name for her son. And I was at the mouth of the river, the Squamish River. And I was looking out to the river, looking out to the sound. How sound there. And I heard my name being called. Halakdin! Halakdin! And I was in this dream world, wondering who's calling me. But I can't see who's calling me. Halakdin! And I heard, I thought, oh, maybe it's, I woke up and I thought, oh, it was my wife calling me. So I said, what, 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 what do you want? And I woke her up, woke her up because I was quite loud. I said, what do you want? I said, oh, 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 no, I was just in a dream. I'm sorry. I was, uh, I was at the mouth of the river looking for a name for her son, the Squamish River. And anyways, this boy, Stanley, he was uh born at 11 pounds eight ounces so big boy heavy boy and he's long and then i got an email four days later because the four is important to us too four days later i got an email from one of my elders says oh i heard you had a baby boy and he's a big course course means big spring salmon i says that's it it had to do with the river and it had to do with the salmon. Because, you know, the salmon is, travels the world. It goes all over the place. So they're important to us. They're very sacred to us. Like, like I've shared with the flood story. That's our main staple. We respect salmon. Like people. We have a ceremony before we we take our first salmon when they come back to give them thanks for them going to give our life away for us to survive. But, um, there's just so much teachings to share with you. But I don't know how long I've been rambling. Have I been rambling long enough? Or how much more time do I have here? Well, um, we do have a question in the Q&A chat for you that's actually related to salmon um, and yeah we have about 13 minutes left in our webinar so okay. uh, so yeah so I can put the question forward to you it's from Tim complicated question but what do you think we humans should do to ensure the salmon water orca connection remains strong healthy and sustainable I think it starts from uh you know, as human beings, we seem to can everything. You know, if we let them 
get where they need to go and create more plentiful salmon. You know, I, I think we'll, I call it, we dam things up. We dam it all up so much that it, it's not able to replenish in time. You know, we got to think of the future. We need to think of this, the wild salmon, not farm salmon. We got to think of the wild salmon and uh, uh, just help them out. We need to help them out right from the streams to the creeks, to the rivers, to the sea, to the oceans. You know, it's not just our area, it's worldwide. Because once the salmon are out in the Pacific Ocean, it's all up for grabs. And we all have to focus on coming together because, you know, Earth is only one. We're all one and we have to look after it in order to look after us. Because, you know, one of the teachings that uh, Chief Seattle says, Earth does not belong to us, we belong to the Earth. You know, we have to think that way in order to be a part of the Mother Earth. That's the way I, I see it anyways. Good question, Tim. I'm That's sure we could talk a long time with that. That is a good question. and. A great answer. I'm really appreciating the wisdom and stories that you're sharing with us. We have um, another question coming in the Q&A, and it's from Chuck. Do you have a favorite song that was gifted to you by the oceans? I only have one song, the one I shared with you. That's the only song that ever, ever came to me. And it just comes to me when I need, I guess when I need it. I know a lot of songs went from my mother's side, the Kwagi side, from the Namgis, and then on my father's side, the Squamish, Squamish. And also because of the canoe journeys, we're on the water, we share with each other of our of our teachings and and uh, one song that came strong for all the for all the canoe journeys is a healing song from Chief Bobby Joe and Chief Frank Nelson, and they allowed the song to be shared and to be used. And it's a healing song to, when we're on the water, we want to heal, not just our own minds and our own bodies, but the spirit of everything, everything around us. We need to heal the waters, the land, Mother Earth. We need to heal ourselves and our, and our mental thoughts. I'll share a little bit of that song. That would be great. It's real long, but I'm going to, again, to keep it short. <clears throat> oh, my God. Thanks for sharing. I wish that if we were in person, I'm sure there would be an applause after that. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> another question, uh, there's some more questions coming in. Uh, do you still do the canoe journeys like the one you did in 1993? Yes, I've been on several canoe journeys, but I, after I made, oh, sorry, I made a mistake here. Something's gonna happen. Oh, good thing it didn't go on. I hit a tile. I never go ring a phone. <laughs> um, I have a family canoe, 
and uh, just going to have to because when you build a cedar canoe, the cedar canoes always needs maintenance. So back in the day, the canoes would have been if they're not used, you submerge it so the water it stays wet, or you cover it so that you don't want the canoe to dry out because the water the wood expands and keeps it from leaking. So the cedar is light, and um, and the wood expands. So I I need to repair this one because it's been it's been in a warehouse for about a year and a half now and it's probably dry and it's cracked because when it dries it cracks so i'll have to repair it so i'd love to get back on it this is the paddle i had all our whole family make our own paddles and you can see I, again we have salish design on it and this is what i call my family logo we come from the wolf clan and we're joined at the hip and the wolf, we were, when we were wolf, we stood up, we took our fur coat off, and then we became our human form. So we have a relationship with the four-legged people. And that's, so that's uh, the um, stakaya, we call it stakaya in our family. In our family. <clears throat> and this color here would call, symbolizes red ochre, symbolizes protection. So we need to be protected when we're on a journey because you know the waters can get rough and we have to stay calm and stay focused because we the water can take you. You gotta respect it and and move with it. And there's other things you have I was taught when I was out in the water when I was younger, when I went fishing or hunting out in House Sound. Keep an eye up above you because sometimes seagulls will flow, soar around real high and they're soaring above you. When you see that soaring above you, it's time to find shelter because there's big winds are coming. So you bring our canoe into the, because back in the day we had dugout canoes, but we cut the back off and we put a plywood there and we put an outboard on it. And that's what I was zipping around out in House Sound when I was younger. So we had to go find shelter. There's Defense Island. There's other areas along House Sound I can just dip into and wait until the winds calm down, then I go back out again. I um, I'm gonna keep that seagull tip in mind when I go out sailing <laughs> this summer. Make sure I don't get caught in anything nasty. Yeah. Um okay, one I think we have time for one one last question, and this is from Jeanette. It's, she's wondering about um, the role of women in the strength. And she says, are women also part of the strengthening lessons of the water? Well, the women are right from the beginning when you're born. You know, you're, uh, your mother is always the one to, to move to. And even to this day, I'm 62. And my mother is... She's 89 now, and you know, at times I would go see her and talk to her, and like I might need a little bit of advice on something. So she's always there for me, and always there for the family. So women are important. Like they said, we always, a lot of chiefs joke around. They said, well, be, behind every great chief is a great woman, a greater woman, right? So she's actually running it. <laughs> So women are important, they're our strength, they're our backbones. That's what I'm always taught. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, and thank you to everyone who came to listen and learn with us today, Heichka. Uh, it, yeah, it was such a special hour. I'm really thankful um, for all of the stories and wisdom that you imparted upon us. Um, for folks in the crowd, um, we have four more presentations coming up this week as part of the BioBlitz. So tomorrow we are going to be discussing intersecting identities and how they are related to your access and relationship to the ocean. And um, my friend Chuck is going to be facilitating that conversation. He was in the audience today, so that was exciting. We're going to be learning all about birds of the Salish Sea on Wednesday. Thursday is all about exploring the intertidal zone. And then on Friday, it's going to be 
um, exploring marine mammals and whales. So stay tuned for all that information. And uh, Haishika, again, thank you so much. Thumbs up. Okay. And uh, I'll see everyone at some future events. I'll see you. Thank you. <laughs> thank Wait, you.